one of the images, I think we all have images of Christmas. We have our personal images, uh, the memories perhaps from childhood or, or even from our, from our children or our grandchildren. And, and the first Christmas, they were kind of aware of what was going on and, the, and the, the sweetness, the innocence, the joy that's involved in that. And then we have our, our images perhaps that are, are most poignant to us from the original Christmas story. Um, and perhaps for you, it is like for me, one of those is the image of of the mother Mary, this young teenage mom who is staring into the face of her newborn son um, and just all of the emotions that go with that for a mother. She was a virgin. She was a servant of the Lord. She was a model of humility. And she and Joseph in many ways, are, are that family around which the Christmas story revolves. But Matthew shares with us in his gospel, in his, um, this, this other perspective on family. He tells us that the family of Jesus going back generation after generation, going to grandparents and great-grandparents and even on back further, was not always was not always the image of virtue, of purity. And so, Matthew, in in, in the first chapter, the introductory chapter of the New Testament, introduces us to the family of Jesus, brings family front and center, tells us about um, people like a woman named Tamar, who you may have never heard of. Tamar and her, her her father-in-law, Judah, who in a highly inappropriate relationship gave birth to a child who would be one of the ancestors of Jesus. Or Rahab the harlot, who Matthew includes on the family tree of Jesus. Or perhaps most scandalous of all is this family of David and Bathsheba. And we remember how that got started and even brought about the death of Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, so that David and Bathsheba would be together. So so Matthew brings family front and center in his telling of the story of the arrival of Jesus, but he doesn't just give us the picture of virtue, the Norman Rockwell family. He shows us that our God works even even in the middle of dysfunction, even in the middle of brokenness, even in the lives of sinners like you and I. But then there is this hopeful couple, Joseph and Mary, who have, who have betrothed themselves to each other, who are committed to each other, and who are going to be welcoming this child who is a blessing from God into their home and into the world that He created. If you're going to be helping to serve the bread this morning, take your position and we'll serve that in just a moment. Because of the coming of Jesus, even those who don't have a biological family, who never had the, the privilege of knowing, who, knowing their mother and father, Even those who were born into a very dysfunctional, sad, sad human family. Because of the birth of Jesus, they have the opportunity to be part of a new family. The family of God. A spiritual family. And so, after the birth of Jesus, as He grows and begins to make disciples, we have this new family where these folks from different backgrounds, different races, different cultures, different personalities, even as the Gospel flows through the New Testament, different religious backgrounds, they call themselves brothers and sisters. And they call God Father. And it starts here in Matthew chapter 1. This family begins there. 
And the Apostle Paul, as he reflects on what unites us in a world that so often thinks about all that divides us, all that should separate, separate us, Paul calls us back to remember the thing that unites us, and that is Jesus Christ. And we are a family, a spiritual family united under him. And so in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes these words about the Lord's Supper that we're about to share together. Paul says, Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one loaf. And so if you're here this morning as part of the Preston Crest family, we're going to share this together. If you're here this morning as a guest here at Preston Crest, we want you to join in our family meal this morning and share this with us as we celebrate Jesus together and celebrate the family that we have through Jesus. Let's, let's pray together before we take the Lord's Supper. Lord Jesus, thank You for coming. Thank You for leaving Your Father's side to be born into this broken world so that we could, through You, be adopted into God's family. Because of You, Jesus, we who are many are now one. Our differences are many. Ages, genders, backgrounds, economics, education, all of that stuff. Even ideas about politics or religion. Our differences are many, but You have joined us together into Your family. And this morning, Jesus, as we break bread together, we are reminded of the blessing of family. We thank You for our earthly families. We thank You for our spiritual family, the church. In Your name, Jesus. Amen. So Matthew starts out with the blessing of family. And very quickly in chapter 1, he goes uh, to begin talking about the blessing of forgiveness. You may ask why he would make this jump from family to forgiveness. Well, I would suggest we merely need to look in the mirror because families are dysfunctional and families aren't perfect and every, every family has struggles because you and I have struggles. You and I have baggage. You and I have weaknesses. And so Matthew takes the spotlight of the Christmas story and shines it on forgiveness. Our need for a Savior. Our need for the grace that God gives. And so in Matthew's story, this angelic messenger visits young Joseph and talks about our need for forgiveness. Matthew 1, verses 20 to 21. But after he, Joseph had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, Yeshua. God saves. God saves. Specifically, the angel comes to Jesus to say, your son is going to save you and save Mary and save all of us from our sins. And it's worth noting that people long before Jesus came, people expected, the Jewish people expected very much that the Messiah would come and deal with sin. It's just that they envisioned the Messiah coming and dealing with, well, other people's sin. That Messiah would come and He would deal with the sins of the Romans. Or Messiah would come and He would deal with the sins of the cruel and the violent. Or Messiah would come and He would deal with the sins of those really wicked people. But the angel proclaims to Joseph that I really need to have my sins dealt with. So Christmas is a time to stop and say, God, forgive me 
forgive me because I have sin in my life. Jesus came to save me from my sins. Jesus came to save you from your sins. The angel says he will come and he will save them from their sins. If you're going to help with the Lord's Supper, please get in, in position. We're going to take the fruit of the vine here in just a moment. But Matthew brings this front and center, doesn't he? The very first chapter of his gospel to tell us that Christmas isn't just about Santa and stockings, isn't just about pumpkin pie and presents or candy canes and carols, but that Christmas is about the greatest gift of all, the greatest blessing of all, because Jesus came, here's the blessing, my sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And so when you think about the Christmas story. Matthew begs you not to think about what's wrong out there. What's wrong that you saw on the, on the, on the, on the O'Reilly show last night, or what's wrong that you read in the newspaper this morning, or what's wrong that you saw your neighbor do the other day. Matthew says, look at yourself. And think about how God's grace through Jesus covers what's wrong with you. What's wrong with your iniquities. And so Christmas is a moment to consider, according to Matthew's account, the blessing of forgiveness. To experience that blessing that comes to us through Jesus. So this story in Matthew invites us to contemplate the blessing of family and the blessing of forgiveness that we can only know through Jesus. Let's pray together before we share the fruit of the vine, the cup, together. Jesus, help us never to neglect the blessing of forgiveness that we have through You. In the midst of the, of the pageantry and the traditions of Christmas, we remember that front and center in the original story of your birth, this message that we are sinners. We are sinners. And we needed a Savior. On that silent night, on that holy night, When you were born, Lord Jesus, our hope for forgiveness was born into this world. And so, Lord, as we drink from the cup of Your love this morning, as we remember how forgiveness of sins was poured out through Your sacrifice, we celebrate, we rejoice, we exult in the grace that You have shown us. And seeing our darkness... You didn't turn your back on us. You didn't abandon us to destruction. Instead, you you came. And your name, Jesus, means God saves. You came to take our wickedness upon yourself so that we could experience freedom and forgiveness of our sins. In your name, amen. Amid all of the lists that come out of the of the ten this, the ten that, the ten richest, or the hundred most beautiful people in the world, or the hundred most powerful people in the world, or the the hundred most influential women in the world. This year, a site called uh, 24-7 Wall Street came up with an odd new list. And they called it the 100 least powerful people in the world. And what they did on their list is they looked at men and women who had achieved great influence, great notoriety, uh, great fame, or great power and influence, and had seen it dwindle into practically nothing. I don't suspect they're truly the hundred least powerful people in the world, but people who fell in, in influence and power. And so some of these names on the list you would recognize, like Charlie Sheen is on there. Other names you, you might not recognize. There's a fellow named Jim Keyes who was the, was the CEO of Blockbuster. Does anyone remember Blockbuster? There used to be this place called Blockbuster where you actually went and traded money to get a DVD to take home. All right, And now there's Netflix and there's, there's Redbox. Um, but, but Jim Keyes is one of those who, who saw uh, 
who saw his influence dwindle. Uh, there was another guy named Mike Jones. Mike Jones is the CEO of MySpace. You remember MySpace? <laughs> MySpace is kind of like Facebook. It used to have 70 million users and guess what? It used to be bigger than Facebook. And now everybody has kind of migrated off MySpace. I would be surprised if if more than a handful here today have a MySpace account. Or you might remember from the news a while back, not too distant past, Hosni Mubarak, who was the dictator, the president, um, de facto the king of, of Egypt, who had almost absolute power in that country for so long, for so many decades. And then finally, because of a popular, generally peaceful outcry, he was forced to essentially flee, to abandon his post and flee in, in shame and disgrace. And Matthew presents us with a story that is, is somewhat similar to those stories, but in one important respect very different. It is the story of one who held incredible power, of a world maker, of a divine being, one who had it all and who came to have virtually nothing. It is the story of Jesus. The difference, of course, with the story of Jesus is, is that it wasn't that his stock plummeted. It wasn't that he got caught in a scandal. It is that he chose to surrender all of that to be born into our world. And not born in Rome, the capital of the empire, not born in the provincial capital of Judea, Jerusalem, but born in this village and in a stable to a peasant couple. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, that by his choice, Jesus, quote, made himself nothing. Made himself nothing. There aren't a lot of stories like this one today. This isn't usually how the story goes, is it? Someone who had it all, who made himself nothing. And so while none of those people on the least powerful list chose to lose their power, he did. He did. And so he voluntarily surrenders his position so that he can bring us into this incredibly deep relationship with God. Here's how it goes in Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 to 23. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Quote, The virgin will be my, with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, or God with us. So the Christmas story tells of this powerful one who chooses to abandon everything and chooses to do it so that God can be with us. This is the blessing of a future with God. There's the blessing of family in the Christmas story. There's the blessing of forgiveness, but there's, there's more. There's the blessing of a future with God. Jesus is our Emmanuel. He is our assurance that God is in fact with us, and that the arrival of Jesus is more than this one-time act of having your sins forgiven. And that's a wonderful thing, but it's more than that. It is the forging of a new you, because now you're not alone. Because now God is with you. 
And there is this version, you know, of forgiveness that says, okay, forgiveness of sins, now I get to start again, I'll try a little harder this time, but I know I'm going to blow it, and then I'll be right back there drinking from the well of forgiveness again, and then I'll be forgiven, and then I'll sin again, and then I'll be forgiven, and this cycle, there's a version of forgiveness that goes like that. That is not the New Testament version of forgiveness. Yes, You will always need forgiveness. But the New Testament story that begins with Jesus, that has God with us, is the story of God making you into a new woman, making you into a new man, making you into a holier and happier person. The Bible affirms that God is with us. And when it does that, it is not saying merely that God is near you, that God is, is kind of around, or that God is a phone call away, wow, the promise is, is infinitely more beautiful than any of those. God with you means that God has come to reside in you. God lives in in you. And so the greatest gift of Christmas is the gift Jesus gives of himself to you. Listen to what he says in his ministry. He says in John 14, 20, he says, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. I am in you. John 15, verse 4, Remain in me, and I will remain... Where? In you. And then as Paul thinks about the implications for his own life, he says in Galatians 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the Christmas story invites you to believe this amazing promise that God intends to live in you. And that is, I believe, the greatest transformational truth ever. There is nothing True about you as a follower of God that has more power to change you, to forge you into a new person than this. That God now resides in you. So, this is good news. You, you may be a person who struggles with with greed. You may be the kind of person who struggles with with lust or anger or bitterness. You may be an individual who struggles with gossip. How's that good news, you ask? Good question. I'm glad you asked that. (laughs) It's good news because Jesus doesn't struggle with greed. And Jesus lives in you. Amen? It's good news because Jesus doesn't have a problem with lust. He doesn't have a problem with bitterness. He doesn't have a problem with unresolved anger. And this Jesus lives in you. Jesus doesn't gossip. And now, He lives in you. I don't know if you see the implications of this, but they are transformational. It means that that I don't just accept His forgiveness, but I accept that Jesus lives in me and that Jesus can do for me things I could never do on my own. And that Jesus brings hope for transformation, hope for change, hope for holiness that would never have been there if I had just been forgiven and that was it. But that's not it. He lives in me. And He is powerful to change me and transform me into a glorious new person. A glorious new person. 
And you may think, wait, glory, that's, that's just for God. Glory doesn't apply to us. Well, it does. It certainly does. In fact, as Paul talks about the implications of this gift of God living in us, uh, of you and I living spirit-powered lives, he says that we are, in in 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says that we are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing, remember the word? Glory. You are being transformed into his likeness with level after level after level of glory being revealed in you because God is at work in you. That means there's hope for us. That means there's hope that old habits can be broken because of Christmas, because of Emmanuel, God with us. There is hope for sin and its bondage being broken because of God with us. And the call is to believe this and not only accept His forgiveness, but accept the truth of Christmas that God is now in you and to yield your life to the power of Christ so that you may be transformed into His likeness 